Good evening. I'm Marion Winnick, here to welcome you to the National Book Critics Circle finalist reading for publishing year 2021, where you'll hear a selection from each of the books we are honoring tonight, read by the authors, or in the case of two deceased authors, by a close family member. You can download the program for this event, as well as one for the award ceremony that follows at the Wildbound registration page. What a treat we are in for. Throughout the two events, you'll see a donate button on the screen. As treasurer of the National Book Critics Circle for the last five years, I've been closely involved in the development of our awards, fellowships, and initiatives fund that your donations support. Every cent of the money goes to community-facing community initiatives designed with our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion in mind. You'll hear more about this from President David Varno later on tonight. Before I turn things over to the MC for tonight's reading, Ophira Eisenberg, let me wish you all a safe and happy spring. And thank you for your support of the National Book Critics Circle and for literary culture worldwide. Ophira Eisenberg is a stand-up comic and a writer, best known for hosting NPR's Ask Me Another for nine years. If you haven't read her hilarious memoir, Screw Everyone, Sleeping My Way to Monogamy, I highly recommend you do so, or you can wait for the upcoming television series. Thank you for joining us, Ophira. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marion, and hello, everybody. I am thrilled to welcome you and host the National Book Critics Circle Award Ceremony. My name is Ophira Eisenberg. Hello, and first, just a huge congratulations to all of our finalists. I am so pleased that we have any kind of situation to celebrate writers. I know we'd all love to be in the same room physically together, but the one wonderful thing, I'm an optimist, of the virtual presentation is that it is accessible to everybody. It is, uh, as Marion mentioned at the beginning, it is wonderful that we are going to be able to hear from all of our final, all of our finalists work. And, you know, that makes a huge difference. We've spent so much time on Zoom. I'm sure we're overloaded by it and so used to it. But maybe like me, you have also discovered some of the features on it that can be helpful. Uh, this is one thing I've learned, which you are, are welcome to take with you if you find yourself in a meeting that you would like to leave because sometimes, you know, meetings can go on too long or perhaps even even a Zoom social gathering that you need an out of. Uh, I do this. Uh, I use the old internet connection failure to my advantage. I do this. I go, uh, wow, that's really interesting. You know what I was just wondering? I And then I, I leave. It's called the freeze and leave, everybody. It's called the freeze and leave. And then you just claim that uh, your internet was down for, I don't know, a couple of days and uh, you do your own thing. So there you go. That's a little something for you. So just try to lighten the mood and bring some joy to you before we celebrate some incredible readings. And now I am honored to present the readings by the finalists for this year's National Book Critics Circle Awards. Congratulations to you all. I can't wait to hear. Hi, I'm Hanif Abdurraqib. This is my book, A Little Devil in America, which I'll be reading from. On times I have forced myself to dance. Safe to say none of the other Muslim kids on the east side of Columbus got MTV or BET in their cribs, and we do at my crib sometimes, like after Pops got a promotion or after Grandma moved in and kept the Bible on her nightstand and had to watch the channel where her game shows ran 24-7. And so it is also safe to say that I was the only one in the Islamic Center on Broad Street who got to stay up and watch the shows on MTV that came on after my parents cut out the lights and went up to bed. And it was only me and the warmth of an old television's glow and the DJ spinning CNC music factory for people in baggy and colorful get-ups and bouncing on a strobe light drenched floor. And so it is safe to say that I only danced along the slick surface of my basement floor with the moon out and all the lights in the house out and the television playing hits. And this 
wasn't exactly practicing dance moves as much as it was learning the different directions my limbs could flail in. And there is no church like the church of unchained arms being thrown in every direction in the silence of a sleeping home. And speaking of church, to be Muslim is to pray in silence sometimes, even though the call to prayer is one of the sweetest songs I can hang in the air. And there is no praise and there is no stomping in the aisles and there is no Holy Spirit to carry the blame for all men are passing out or shouting or the body's pulsing convulsions. And I do not want a spirit to enter me, but I do want a girlfriend or at least a kiss from a girl at the Islamic Center where we go on Friday afternoons in the summer for Juma prayer and kick off our shoes on the carpet and slip into the hallway where the boys and girls would congregate briefly before being separated to pray. And it is absolutely safe to say that with my socks on the marble tile of the Islamic Center on Broad Street, I felt overcome by something we will call holy, I suppose, for the sake of not upsetting the divine order. And this was the mid nineties. And so no one was really doing the moonwalk anymore. And even when they did, no one was doing it right. And there is only one Michael and I am not him. And still with the girls at the Islamic Center standing in line by the water fountain, I thought now is the time. And I was decidedly not in the dark of my basement anymore where I knew the floors and I understood every corner of the architecture. And I slid back on the top of my toes and no one even turned their eyes towards me. And so no one could tell me about the stairs I was sliding towards. And so no one saw my brief moment of rhythm before it unraveled. And just like that, I was in a pile of discarded shoes. And it is safest to say that there was no girlfriend for me that summer or the summer after. And the cable at my house got cut off the year my mother died. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jeremy Atherton Lynn, and I am the author of Gay Bar. Now that I was finally there, I found myself serious. Joan appeared determined too. I'd cut her hair at a postmodern angle. We arrived just as the place filled. A pretty girl dancing on a platform held her long arms aloft, disco limbs. She reached down and pulled me up. I felt unworthy of being on the stage in such a glamorous room. I scanned the crowd. Everyone seemed to look in my direction. The British kids bounced collectively with hairstyles brushed forward to the chin. The tall ceilings made the nightclub seem immense, a sickly smelling cathedral. Atop the wrought iron stairwell, the mezzanine was heaving. The cute boys looked like cartoons of cute boys, like those back in LA we thought might be gay until it turned out they weren't. They played in noise bands and were dating Chloe Sevigny. But here, they glanced back at me. I swooned over two or three before locking eyes with a boy whose beauty was a few masterful strokes away from ordinary. He twirled his wrists and rolled his eyes skyward sardonically. That was the way to dance to Britpop. The boy moved in a manner at once bashful and blithe. He had a retrousse nose and a mouth that was small, but with pillowy lips. His eyes looked as dark as the night. Then he disappeared from the dance floor as had Juan. When I found her at a small table, I saw that the boy and his group were sitting just behind on a bench along the wall. I made use of the ashtray on the empty table between us, turning back toward him each time I tapped my jeton. Soon enough, his companions made a performance out of leaving us alone. I'm so embarrassed, the boy mouthed at their departure. He shook his head coquettishly. I took my place next to him and saw his eyes were actually blue. He mumbled his name, which I could not catch. Jeremy, I shouted back. I could tell we were both trying not to laugh. He did a little, so I did as well like releasing a thin stream of air from a soda bottle so that it doesn't erupt. Hello, uh, Rodrigo Garcia. The book is A Farewell to Gabo and Mercedes. On Wednesday night, sleep is choppy. I am anxious that I will be woken up by a knock on the door telling me that he has died. I get up at dawn and walk to his room and the nurse informs me that he didn't stir during the night. He is in the exact same position I last saw him, breathing almost imperceptibly. I wonder if the nurses are still stretching and repositioning him to avoid bed sores or whether we are beyond that. I shower, dress, and return to the room. Now in the morning light, he looks like someone else, an austere twin brother with gaunt features and translucent skin that I don't know as well. I feel differently about this guy, detached. Maybe that is the purpose of the transformation to help you uncouple, 
Just as a simple look at your newborn instantly triggers feelings of attachment. After breakfast, I can hear the vallenatos playing in my father's room. It's his favorite musical form, and he always returned to it after periods of infidelity with chamber music or pop ballads. Even as his memory loss accelerated, he could, if given the opening verse, recite from memory many of the poems of the Spanish Golden Age. After that ability waned, he could still sing along to his favorite songs. The vallenato is an art form so particular to the world he was born into that even in his last months, incapable of remembering practically anything, his eyes would light up with excitement at the opening accordion notes of a classic one. His secretary would often play long compilations of them as he sat in his study, happily trapped in a time tunnel. So now in the last couple of days, the nurses have started to play them loudly in his room, windows wide open. They filled the house. Some of them are by his compadre, Rafael Escalona. In this context, I find them haunting. They take me as far back in his life as anything possibly can. And I travel through it and back to the present where they play like a final lullaby. Hello, hello from Ireland. Um, my name is Thirin Negrifa and I'm the author of A Ghost in the Throat. When we first met, I was a child and she had been dead for centuries. Look, I am 11, a girl who is terrible at sums and at sports, a girl given to staring out windows, a girl whose only real gift lies in daydreaming. The teacher snaps my name, startling me back to the flimsy prefab. Her voice makes it a fine day in 1773 and sets English soldiers crouching in ambush. I add ditch water to drench their knees. Their muskets point toward the young man who is tumbling from his saddle now in slow, slow motion. A woman rides in to kneel over him, her voice rising in an antique formula of breath and syllable the teacher calls a queen, a keen to lament the dead. Her voice generates an echo strong enough to reach a girl in the distance with dark hair and bitten nails. It's me. Hello, I'm Albert Samaha, author of Concepcion, An Immigrant Family's Fortunes. My mom and I learned parallel stories of America. Her earliest understanding filtered through histories written by white people in positions of authority, broadcast across the ocean in textbook tales of a democracy founded upon Christian values, the reassuring rhetoric of presidential speeches in John Wayne movies, newscasts on internal conflicts that nudged America to a better place, snippets of Martin Luther King Jr.'s words about seeing the mountaintop and the moral arc of the universe bending toward justice. The understanding hardened with time, packed together by her migrant ambition to learn the rules and climb the ranks. The contours of American reality unfurled for me in songs, shows, and sports books. Culture seeped faster into my childhood brain than classroom knowledge. The stories I heard were set amid unjust odds, neglectful institutions, and repressive forces. I learned about Huey Newton from a Tupac song, Two Shots in the Dark, Now Huey's Dead, before I ever heard his name mentioned in school. I read in the paperback on my nightstand that Josh Gibson might have been better than Babe Ruth, and I watched from the DVD spinning in our living room the crew cutted cop kill Radio Rahim. Like many second generation immigrants, I learned about our country from black people. I didn't, I didn't yet know about Parchman Farm Prison or Black Wall Street or the Tuskegee syphilis experiment or the massacres of the post reconstruction era or the CIA supplying the crack cocaine trade, but I was learning the language necessary to understand the magnitude of that history. From those stories in childhood, warning marks etched on the road by travelers long before us, I picked up on the fact that my family and our fellow immigrants weren't new arrivals merely to a new nation, weren't new arrivals merely to a nation, but to a long-standing system of racial oppression, suspended somewhere between those who conquered the land by blood and those whose blood built the empire. We had come by choice, but in peace, 
with neither the privileges of whiteness nor the weight of blackness. Where did that leave us? My name is Susan Bernofsky. I am the author of Clairvoyant of the Small, the Life of Robert Walzer. Forced to leave school at age 14 out of economic necessity, Walzer apprenticed as a bank clerk in his native Beale while harboring dreams of becoming an actor. After moving to Zurich to work in the bookkeeping division of an insurance firm, he published his first poems and then quit his job to devote himself to writing. Soon after his first book, Fritz Kocher's Essays appeared, he moved to Berlin to join his older brother, Karl, an artist and stage set designer. The two became notorious for their antics and boisterous conduct, a pair of enfants terribles living large among the creative spirits of pre-lapsarian Berlin, a hotbed of literary and cultural activity. Thanks to his brother, Walzer was welcomed into lofty artistic circles, but he felt ill at ease in high society, which he rebelled against by enrolling in Butler School, scandalizing his artistic peers, even after beginning to perform as a writer by producing novels, three in rapid succession that were well received by critics, including Robert Muzio, his books failed to reach a wider audience. They were too quirky, too seemingly modest, too Swiss. And while his short prose was admired by fellow writers, Kafka loved reading Walzer aloud. The young dreamer was soon a has-been with writer's block. He retreated back to Switzerland in defeat. Robert Walzer's true career begins here. As his dream of literary stardom fizzled, he began to experiment with short prose forms that over the next two decades developed into the high modernist masterpieces that became his signature achievement. Taking the feuilleton style essay as his starting point, he layered on strata of descriptive flourish and metaphor until he'd constructed elaborate edifices around the simplest topics interwoven with fictional elements such that it was impossible to tell where essay ended and story began. Hi, my name is Keisha Blaine and I'm the author of Until I Am Free, Fannie Lou Hamer's Enduring Message to America. On August, the 27th, 1962, Fannie Lou Hamer found her calling. That evening, the 44-year-old black sharecropper attended a mass meeting arranged by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, also known as SNCC, an interracial civil rights group that played a central role in organizing and encouraging black residents in the South to register to vote. Held at the William Chapel Missionary Baptist Church in Ruleville, the SNCC meeting brought together activists and local residents interested in learning more about the group's voting registration efforts in the community. The meeting transformed Hamer, who learned for the first time that she had a right to vote as a citizen of the United States. I didn't know anything about voting. I didn't know anything about registering to vote. They were talking about how we could vote out people that we didn't want in office, she later recalled. That sounded interesting enough to me that I wanted to try it. Hamer realized in that moment that she had the ability to transform American society. Access to the ballot gave her the power to shape local, state, and national politics. The 1962 mass meeting in Mississippi marked the beginning of Hamer's entry into the civil rights movement. From that day forward, she chose to devote her life to expanding black political rights, emboldened by the belief that black people through the formal political process held the power to overturn centuries of unjust laws. It was especially fitting that Hamer came to realize her life's purpose while sitting in the pews of a local church. A woman of faith, Hamer was grounded by the teachings of the Bible. She believed that God had ordained her calling to passionately advocate for black people and other marginalized groups. It was a spiritual calling 
as much as a political one. Hi. I'm Rebecca Donner, and this is my book, All the Frequent Troubles of Our Days. Her aim was self erasure. The more invisible she was, the better her chances of survival. In her journal, she noted what she ate, read, thought. The first was uncontroversial, the second and third were not. For this reason, she hid the journal. When she suspected the Gestapo was closing in on her, she destroyed it, burned it, most likely. She was at the harrowing center of the German resistance, but she wasn't German, nor was she Polish or French. She was American, conspicuously so. The men she recruited acquired code names, armless, beamer, worker. She operated under no code name. Still, she was elusive. The nature of her work required absolute secrecy. She didn't dare tell her family who were scattered across the towns and dairy farms of the Midwest. They remained bewildered that she, at 26, had jumped aboard a steamer ship and crossed the Atlantic, leaving behind everyone she loved. Her family is my family. Three generations separate us. She preferred anonymity, so I will whisper her name, Mildred Harnock. In 1932, she held her first clandestine meeting in her apartment, a small band of political activists that grew into the largest underground resistance group in Berlin by the end of the decade. In the fall of 1942, the Gestapo pounced. She was thrown in prison. So were her co-conspirators. During a hastily convened trial at the Reichskriegsgericht, the Reich Court Martial, a prosecutor who'd earned the moniker Hitler's Bloodhound hammered them with questions. She sat on a wooden chair in the back of the courtroom. Other chairs held high-ranking Nazi officers. At the center of the room sat a panel of five judges. Everyone there was German except her. When it was her turn, she approached the stand. She was emaciated, her lungs ravaged by tuberculosis she'd contracted in prison. How long she stood there remains unknown. Surviving documents don't note the time the prosecutor began questioning her or the time he stopped. What is known is this. The answers she gave him were lies, real waters. Hi everyone, my name is Mark Harris. I'm the author of Mike Nichols, A Life. In the origin story that Mike Nichols liked to tell, he was born at the age of seven. The first image of himself he chose to conjure for people was that of a boy on a boat holding his younger brother's hand, traveling from Germany to America. They were unaccompanied on that six day crossing in 1939, their ailing mother still bedbound in Berlin. Their father was already in New York. His two small sons had not seen him for almost a year. Nichols was not yet real even to himself. His name was Michael Igor Peshkovsky, or perhaps it wasn't. Decades later, his brother Robert, looking into his family's history, told him that according to the ship's manifest and the petition for naturalization later filed by his father, his name was actually Igor Michael Peshkovsky. Igor, a horror movie name. Nichols looked at him impassively. Maybe, he said. Maybe it was. It didn't matter. Whatever his name when he boarded ship, it was gone by the time he got to New York. Nichols turned the transatlantic crossing into a story, his first self-revelation as anecdote, an approach that he would eventually refine into a shield and a disguise, but also into a style of directing, a means of conveying an idea or a feeling or a circumstance to an actor that he deployed with precision and finesse over a five decade career in movies and theater. He first tried it out on journalists in the twenties when suddenly everyone wanted to know who Mike Nichols was and where on earth he had come from. The story he told, droll and wry with a slight undertow of despair, was that at seven, he was packed onto the boat knowing only two sentences in what would become his new language. I do not speak English, and please do not kiss me. In some tellings, he spoke no English at all, and instead wore those two warnings on a penciled sign pinned to his clothes before boarding. It was this picture, the New Yorker cartoon version of his early life with a punchline that hinted at both utter solitude and defiant standoffishness that Nichols used to explain his personality to others and to himself, a portrait of the artist as the little prince alone on his planet and at home nowhere. 
His childhood in Berlin, his years as either Michael or Igor, barely existed in his memory. At times he pushed the door shut. A Jew in Nazi Germany, parents always fighting, he would say, as detached as if he were musing about a stranger. Aren't all childhoods bad? Hello, <clears throat> my name is Alexander Nemirov, and I am the author of Fierce Poise, Helen Frankenthaler, and 1950s New York. The goddess's boudoir lacks metaphysical pomp, but it does something more daring. Helen's sensitivity allowed her to grant ordinary experience, faltering, incomplete, apparently meaningless, the large solemnity of art. No more promising a feeling than the primping vanity of beauty, an epitome of private life in its self-absorptions, becomes the unlikely stuff of an ongoing dream, a work that goddess-like does not grow old because it is, though complete, never finished. Helen knew how to take a picture right up to the edge of legibility, to leave it just on the verge of literalism and then how to draw it back, letting the emblems retreat into their groves, away from meaning, away from philosophy, away from all explanation, until we have a subtle feeling of experience, hers and ultimately ours, as we encounter this never ending openness. Not without sorrow, Helen, caught the quint, the quick scintillation of days. Hello, I'm Ian Patterson. <clears throat> I'm reading for Jenny Diskey, who is my wife, uh, from this book, Why Didn't You Just Do As You Were Told? The future flashed before my eyes in all its preordained banality. Embarrassment at first to the exclusion of all other feelings, but embarrassment curled at the edges with a weariness, the sort that comes over, with, over you when you're set on a track by something outside your control, and which, although it's not your experience, is so known in all its cultural forms that you could unscrew the cap of the pen in your hand and jot down in the notebook on your lap every single thing that will happen and everything that will be felt for the foreseeable future, including the surprises. I got the joke in. So we'd better get cooking the myth, I said to the poet, sitting to one side and slightly behind me. The poet, with an effort, got his face to work and responded properly. This time we quit while the going's good. The doctor and nurse were blank. When we got home, the poet said he supposed they didn't watch much US TV drama. It was only later that I thought that maybe, ever since Breaking Bad's first broadcasts, Oncologists and their nurses all over the Western world have been subjected to the meth cooking joke each time they've applied their latest, assiduously rehearsed, non-brutal techniques for telling a patient as gently but honestly as possible, having first sized up their inner resilience with a few apparently innocent questions. Tell me what you've been expecting from this appointment, that they have inoperable cancer. Perhaps they failed to laugh at my doubtless evasive bid to lighten the mood, not because they didn't get the reference, but because they'd said to each other too often after such an appointment, if I hear one more patient say that they should start cooking meth, I'm going to wrestle them to the ground and bellow death into their faces. Pay attention, I'm fucking telling you something important. I was mortified at the thought that before I'd properly started out on the cancer road, I'd committed my first platitude. I was already a predictable cancer patient. Hi, I'm Melissa Phoebos. I'm the author of Girlhood. In the 18th century, sluts pennies were hard nuggets in a loaf of bread that resulted from incomplete kneading. I imagine them salty and dense, soft enough to sink your tooth into, but tough enough to stick. What could a handful of sluts pennies buy you? Nothing, a hard word, a slap in the face, a fast hand for your slow ones. Before it carried any sexual connotation, the word slut was a term for a slovenly woman, a poor housekeeper, 
A slut was the maid who left dust on the floor, slut's wool, who left a corner of the room overlooked in her cleaning, a slut's corner, and sometimes she was the dirt itself. A slut was a careless girl, hands sunk haphazardly into the dough, broom stilled against her shoulder, eyes cast out the window, mouth humming a song, always thinking of something else. Was I ever a messy child, a real slut in the making? My clothes tangled on the floor, my books splayed open and dog-eared, their binding split. Dirty dishes on the bookshelf, sticky spoons glued to the rug. I would never have bathed if not commanded. At a certain point, when I got in trouble and wanted to be seen as good again, I would clean my room. But only when I wanted to be good, not when I wanted to be clean, I already understood that goodness was something you earned, that existed only in the esteem of others. Alone in my room, I was always good, or I was never good. It was not a thing to care about alone in my room, unless I was thinking about the people outside, the ways I might need them to see me. Hi, my name is Jesse McCarthy, and uh, I am the author of Who Will Pay Reparations on My Soul. For the longest time, I contemplated writing D'Angelo a letter. It wasn't going to be a real letter that I would put in the mailbox and send to Richmond or New York City or London or wherever the man might have vanished to. What I envisioned was something more like a James Baldwin essay, an open letter where the prose discovers something about the world, answers a set of questions posed by its very appearance. I wanted to write D'Angelo a letter from a region of my mind. But now in lieu of that lost letter to an uncertain future, I can address his prodigal return in the present. If you never listened to Voodoo or Brown Sugar and didn't spend a significant portion of your life thinking about your place in the world, sexually, racially, lyrically, that holy trinity of black music, then you won't necessarily understand the overwrought emotion that the sudden unannounced appearance of the first new album by D'Angelo in 14 years might arouse. But there are a lot of folks out there who have been waiting or forgot they were waiting for this moment. And for everyone else, now is the perfect time to discover why people have been holding out hope for so long. To situate things, one has to recall that in a generation in which Black music was defined, often in conflicting ways, by a dialectical tension between hip hop and R&B, with myriad generational and intracultural implications, D'Angelo was a rare point of consensus. In the 1990s, Brown Sugar was one of the few albums that fans of Tupac and Tony Braxton could instantly agree on. And it went beyond the music. It was him. It was us. Maybe because he had the swagger of Pac without the rap sheet, this radiant self-possession, slim cross on his chest, those neat cornrows and butter-soft leather jackets. And yet he could sing like Smokey Robinson and carried about him everywhere the endearingly hushed softness of a choir boy. He was synthesis and expression. And Brown Sugar seemed to embody a set of collective fantasies that we were all having, but given the ruggedness of the era, would never dare to express out loud. I'm talking about those of us who were caught out in that New Jack Swing moment when Teddy Riley somehow pulled everything together. And we thought in a brief, brightly colored MTV thought bubble that we might actually get through the 90s with a smile a high top fade, hammer pants, and a guitar. When New Edition came through puberty as BBD, roller rinks were hot. Brandy was down. Latifah was queen. Lauren was the most beautiful woman you had ever seen. Motown Philly was back again. Arsenio was on. And you made mixtapes recorded off FM radio, lovingly labeled in wild style Sharpie.
Uh, hello. Uh, I am Mark McGurl, author of uh, Everything and Less, the novel in the age of Amazon. The status of genre fiction has never been higher in elite lit circles of literary opinion, which now routinely dismiss blanket prejudices against popular forms as snobbery or disingenuousness. In this, these circles have in a sense merely gotten with the program of shamelessly pluralized pleasures evident everywhere in consumer culture. In Amazonia, the more is always the merrier. But this open-mindedness does not generally extend to the romance novel. For my money, if there were no other reason to be fascinated by this genre, the sheer depths at which it dwells in official hierarchies of literary value should suffice to inspire serious critical reflection upon it. Surely a badness so profound, so completely disqualifying of critical esteem or even sustained curiosity has something interesting to tell us about the contemporary literary field as a whole. Finally, the romance affirms. It traffics in happy endings. This is its function, its failure, its perceived inferiority to works of critical force. And yet, how could anyone read a story as sweet as the self-published trans polyamory romance, The House of Enchanted Feminization, and not be charmed by its sheer will to happiness? It's not that critique has run out of steam. Critique chugs along, fed by the infinite coal supply of capitalism's contradictions. It's just that critique should be as thoroughly dialectical as it can, as suspicious of its own suspicion as of anything else. After all, every single novel ever written is an affirmation of a sort, if only of the worth of writing a novel at all. In its pages, whole worlds might go up in fictional flames, but that burning is also the building of yet another novel. If I generally find it difficult to get behind Amazon's theory and practice of literary life, skeptical as I am of its corporate populism, these efflorescences at the very margin of that life seem self-evidently redeemable and lovable for their existential courage. Hello. I'm Amiya Srinivasan, and I am the author of The Right Effect. The question then is how to dwell in the ambivalent place where we acknowledge that no one is obliged to desire anyone else, that no one has a right to be desired, but also that who is desired and who isn't is a political question, a question often answered by more general patterns of domination and exclusion. It is striking though unsurprising that while men tend to respond to sexual marginalization with a sense of entitlement to women's bodies, those women who protest against their sexual marginalization typically do so with talk not of entitlement, but empowerment. That said, the radical self-love movements among black, fat, and disabled women do ask us to treat our sexual preferences as less than perfectly fixed. Black is beautiful and big is beautiful are not just slogans of empowerment, but proposals for a revaluation of our values. The question posed by such movements is not whether there is a right to sex, there isn't, but whether there is a duty to transfigure as best as we can our desires. To take this question seriously requires that we recognize that the very idea of fixed sexual preference is political, not metaphysical. As a matter of good politics, we treat the preferences of others as sacred. We are rightly wary of speaking of what people really want. That way we know authoritarianism lies. This is true most of all in sex where invocations of real or ideal desires have long been used as a cover for the rape of women and gay men. But the fact is that our sexual preferences can and do alter sometimes under the operation of our own wills, not automatically, but not impossibly either. What's more, sexual desire doesn't always neatly conform to our own sense of it, as generations of gay men and women can attest. Desire can take us by surprise, leading us somewhere we hadn't imagined we would ever go, 
or towards someone we never thought we would lust after or love. In the very best cases, the cases that perhaps ground our best hope, desire can cut against what politics has chosen for us and choose for itself. My name is Ruben Blum and I'm N, yes, N historian. Soon enough though, I guess I'll be historical by which I mean I'll die and become history myself in a rare type of transformation traditionally reserved for the purer scholars. Lawyers die and don't become the law. Doctors die and don't turn into medicine. But biology and chemistry professors pass away and decompose into biology and chemistry. They mineralize into geology. They disperse into their science just as surely as mathematicians become statistics. The same process holds true for us historians. In my experience, we're the only ones in the humanities for whom this holds true. The only ones who become what we study. We age, we yellow, we go wrinkled and brittle along with our materials until our lives subside into the past to become the very substance of time. Or maybe that's just the Jew in me talking. Goyim believe in the word becoming flesh, but Jews believe in the flesh becoming word, a more natural, rational incarnation. By way of further introduction, I will now quote a remark made to me by the who shall remain nameless then president of the American Historical Association when I met him at a symposium back in my student days just after the Second World War. Ah, he said, limply pressing my hand. Blum, did you say? Uh, a Jewish historian? Though the man surely intended this remark to wound me, it merely succeeded in bringing delight. And even now I find I can smile at the description. I appreciate its accidental imprecision and the way the double entendre can function as a type of psychological test. A Jewish historian, when you hear that, what do you think? What image springs to mind? The point is the epithet as applied is both correct and incorrect. I am a Jewish historian, but I am not an historian of the Jews, or I've never been one professionally. Hello, I'm Rachel Cusk. My book is Second Place, uh, and this is the beginning. I once told you, Jeffers, about the time I met the devil on a train leaving Paris, and about how after that meeting, the evil that usually lies undisturbed beneath, beneath the surface of things rose up and disgorged itself over every part of life. It was like a contamination, Jeffers. It got into everything and turned it bad. I don't think I realised how many parts of life there were until each one of them began to release its capacity for badness. I know you've always known about such things and have written about them, even when others didn't want to hear and found it tiresome to dwell on what was wicked and wrong. Nonetheless, you carried on, building a shelter for people to use when things went wrong for them too. And go wrong, they always do. Fear is a habit like any other, and habits kill what is essential in ourselves. I was left with a kind of blankness, Jeffers, from those years of being afraid. I kept on expecting things to jump out at me. I kept expecting to hear the same laughter of that devil I heard the day he pursued me up and down the train. It was the middle of the afternoon and very hot, and the carriages were crowded enough that I thought I could get away from him merely by going and sitting somewhere else. But every time I moved my seat, a few minutes later, there he'd be, sprawled across from me and laughing. What did he want with me, Jeffers? He was horrible in appearance, yellow and bloated with bloodshot bile-coloured eyes. And when he laughed, he showed a dirty tooth with one entirely black tooth right in the middle. He wore earrings and dandyish clothes that were soiled with the sweat that came pouring out of him. The more he sweated, the more he laughed and he gabbled non-stop in a language I couldn't recognise, but it was loud and full of what sounded like curses. You couldn't exactly ignore it, and yet that was precisely what all the people in the carriages did. My name's Sarah Hall, and I'm the author of Burnt Coat. I thought at first it was tiredness, the aftermath of a particularly hard winter. Burnt Coat is like a cathedral, vaulted, difficult to heat. All the old pains have been playing up, 
My shoulders are ruined from lifting what I shouldn't, timber, pallets, and my hands often lock. Sometimes I convinced myself I was in permanent remission. Maybe I was like one of the last great miraculous elms in the park, unaffected by blight. Or I'd found the trick of acceptance. Psychologists have told me I have a high tolerance for uncertainty, as if I didn't know. I'm sure now. There are small blisters in the webs between my fingers. There's that deep ache, the weakening heart. It's putting itself back together inside me. You come back to, of course, who you were when we met and what you became. None of this returns without your feet on the stairs, your taste, the pressure against my back. You reform in the bed, eyes bright and stunned, apologizing for our mess. I remember those delusive moments when we shared the same mouthful of air, the same bloodstream almost. I remember the scent of orange blossom from the little tree you gave me, that strange courting gift. It's wild zest, the smell of woken groves, of cologne given to visitors and funeral parlors. I have two names, you told me the first night, one given at birth and one by the government. I asked, which name shall I call you? Soon, remembering, even thinking will be difficult. People say timing is everything, and it's true. You arrived just as that brilliant ill star was enunciating. I imagine you as a messenger. You were the last one here before I closed the door of Burnt Coat, before we all shut our doors. Hello, I'm Honoré Fanen Jeffers, and I am the author of The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. The loss of Africa. We know of those taken from the place called Africa, captured by men who had transgressed against flesh for a long time, the Africans who stole others and kept those folks for themselves, the Africans who stole others and sold those to the Europeans who would take them over the water and humiliate and sometimes torture them for life. We know about the dark, dark folks who never would see home again. We know dates, we know hours, we know disbelief, we know mourning. We know about the years even before 1619 and the years that would come after. We know about those Africans who arrived in a place that the English call Jamestown, Virginia. We know which villages these Africans lived in before they were stolen, their collection of conical huddled homes domestic birds running on the ground of a courtyard, feathers of black and red, a goat tied to the side of a hut, and every morning a mother rising from her pallet, tossing grains in a pestle, and we try not to weep over what was lost to these folks. We know about an enemy from a neighboring village. We know of strangers who saw wealth in meat rocking bone. The names of the captives are lost to everyone but us, their tribes, their children, if they had them, their beloveds they'd hope to marry in ceremonies of laughter and song. Hey, how do you do, NBCC crew? Uh, Colson Whitehead here, about to read from my book, uh, Harlem Shuffle. Thanks for having me uh, with this great bunch of folks. So Ray Carney has hired Pepper, an old crook, to uh, follow, tail, stake out uh, a crooked banker named Wilfred Duke. Pepper's grandpa, Alfred, kept a steel drum smoker out back in Newark on Clinton Avenue. He'd do ribs, brisket, make his own sausage. Grandpa Alfred's father had been a butcher and cook on an indigo plantation in South Carolina and asked down the mysteries. You throw chops on some coals, Pepper's grandfather said. That's one way to cook a piece of meat. A few minutes later, you got that black on it, you're done. But barbecue is slow. 
put it in that smoke, you gotta be ready to wait. The heat and smoke's gonna do its work, but you gotta wait. One was fast and one was slow. And it was the same with stick-ups and stakeouts. Stick-ups were chops. They cook fast and hot, you're in, you're out. A stakeout was ribs, fire down low, slow, taking your time. Pepper was a gourmand and that he liked chops and he liked ribs. He hadn't planned a job in years with the legwork that that entailed, casing the place, clocking passenger and vehicle traffic, how often the prowl car made the rounds, the schedule of the staff, managers, and security guards, figuring out when to take a piss. He'd enjoyed that side of things once, conception, pulling it all together, choosing a crew. Nowadays, he let the ebb and flow of jobs take him. He wasn't as sharp or as hungry as he used to be. Stuff fell into his lap or didn't. Some cat got out of Danamora and wanted back in or another dude was cooking up a big score. Maybe Pepper wasn't as sharp these days, but the quality of hood they turned out now, he was sharp enough. No, he hadn't made ribs in a while, but it came back quick. Thanks a lot. Stay safe. Hi, I'm Ashley C. Ford, and this is my book, Somebody's Daughter. How did it go? I opened my mouth to answer, and instead I dissolved. In the visiting room, there was no space to break down to melt with emotion. Sitting across from my father for the first time in 13 years, both of us swollen with all the things we needed to say to one another, the thought of letting all of this feeling overtake me seemed wasteful, inefficient. In those moments, I needed more from myself, restraint. But now I was in a car with one of my closest friends. The visit was over. Every little thing I couldn't allow myself to feel in my father's presence made itself known. Trent rubbed my back. What can I do? After I caught my breath, I answered, a drink. I need a drink. Trent laughed and mentioned that he'd spotted a winery on our way there. We should pop in and see if we could do a tasting. I agreed. As we pulled off, Trent said, did you get what you needed? I rolled down the window again and closed my eyes. Yes, I think I did. How does that feel? I smiled to myself. My father's permission to keep writing felt like a secret I wasn't ready to tell. I leaned farther out the window. I could hear the wind zipping past the planes of my face, still tight and sticky with tears I hadn't bothered to wipe away. The sunshine turned the inside of my eyelids pink and purple. Inside of myself, I let go. I did not worry about what I hadn't been able to share or the life I was returning to. For half a minute, I was flying. For half a minute, I knew I had it in me to tell the truth and be loved anyway. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jocelyn Johnson and I'm gonna read from my Monticello. Virginia is not your home. They hung that name on you at birth, but Virginia was never your home. Read not Read Nausea by Sartre and give yourself a new one. Trumpet your new name to the liver spotted washroom mirror like a coronation. Gape your mouth, then angle your tongue behind your teeth. While you're at it, work to remedy those other afflictions, that fetid high hill R that has planted itself in the middle of words like wash. Scrub the stink of manure from your clothing. And while your young body churns over the basin, keep whispering your new, still secret name. Believe that if you can just change this, you can change everything. 
When your furtive girl body begins to unfold, pull your hair back so severely that the boys don't tug you down below the bleachers. Take to wearing father's fishing flannel, flannels to ward off solicitations to their string of tissue paper dances. Don't accept it when they ask, who do you think you are? Whenever you test some sweet protracted word on your tongue, don't accept the moldy hymnals, the marquee salvations, the wayward way that mama courts heaven like a scornful lover. Don't ache too badly for the milk cows in the pastures, their slick contour ribs pressing through. Take French, lock your doors, and trust in your 16-year-old self. Hi, uh, I'm Tori Peters. I'm the author of Detransition Baby. <clears throat> the question for Reese, were married men just desperately attracted to her? Or was the pool of men who were available to her as a trans woman only those who had already locked down a cis wife and could now explore with her? The easy answer, the one that all her girls advocated was to call men dogs. But now here's Reese sneaking around with another handsome, charming motherfucking cheater. Look at her wearing a black lace dress and sitting in his parked beamer while he goes into Dwayne Reed to buy condoms. Then she's going to let him come over to her apartment, avoid the pointed glare of her roommate Iris, and have him do her right on the trite floral bedspread that the last married dude bought her so that when he snuck, so that her room would seem a little more girly and naughty when he snuck away from his wife. Reese had already diagnosed his own, her own problem. She didn't know how to be alone. She fled from her own company, from her own solitude. Along with telling her how awful her cheating men were, her friends also told her that after two major breakups, she needed time to learn to be herself by herself. But she couldn't be alone in any kind of moderate way. Give her a week to herself and she began to isolate, cultivating an ash of loneliness until she was daydreaming about selling everything and drifting away on a boat towards nowhere. To jolt herself back to life, she went on Grindr or Tinder or whatever and administered 10,000 volts to the heart by chasing the most dramatic tachycardia of an affair she could find. Married men were the best for fleeing loneliness because married men also didn't know how to be alone. Married men were experts at being together at not letting go, no matter what, until death do us part. Her married man this time was similar to her others, only this man was better because he was an HIV positive cowboy turned lawyer. He had a thing for trans girls and he had Sarah converted while cheating on his wife with the trans woman and the wife had stayed with him. And now he was at it again with Reese. We Thanks. Um, I'm Larissa Pham and this is my book, Pop Song. Um, there's a, one other piece that I want to tell you about. It is Terrell's hindsight, one of his dark spaces from 1984. The space inside is limited, and the two of us had to wait for a spot to enter. When our time arrived, we shuffled past a curtain through a series of zigzagging dark corridors, the darkness deepening with each step. When the last glimmer of light was gone, I put my hand on the wall and I was scared. I don't remember what Jamie said. I think she told me not to be scared. We stepped into a small, dark room and, unsure of where to sit down, stumbled our way to the two chairs. We sat in the pitch darkness in silence. Minutes passed, five, then ten. I felt the borders of my body dissolve in the absence of light. There was no way to tell who I was or what I was made of. I even thought I could feel the surface of my eyes, really feel them, the film on them, as if I could sense the surface of my own tears. Then out of the darkness resolved a, a soft shifting ball of light, like a will-o'-the-wisp, small, like the moon seen from a city sidewalk and far less bright. At first it looked white, then maybe red. I thought I was hallucinating that I had willed it into existence. Is there a light there? I asked Jamie. Yes, she said, there's a light. We sat there longer, watching the light shift and change, 
our eyes fully opened up to it. I thought I might cry. I thought I heard her crying. Hello, my name is Samantha So Lamb, and I'm the sister of the late Anthony Visnasso, author of After Parties. On behalf of my brother, we're honored to be nominated as one of the 2021 John Leonard finalists for best first book. After Parties represents my brother's love for our Cambodian American community, culture, and family. This debut short story collection grants us an intimate window into the world as he saw it and is so deserving of your consideration for this prestigious nomination. Thank you to the voting members of the National Book Critics Circle for this honor. I would now like to share a passage from Generational Differences, a true story based on my mother's experience working at Cleveland Elementary. Nineteen eighty nine. Cleveland Elementary, Stockton. By now you've read the story of my life. You asked me to document my memories and I've written down what you and my grandkids need to know. I was hesitant at first, I won't lie. Why would anyone want to relive that? But you were persistent, kept saying, we can't let our history become lost in time. Among other intimations that I am too decrepit to avoid my own mortality especially now that your ba has died. So I relented. For months, I culled my memory for gruesome details, the shrapnel of the past you want stowed away for future generations, but mostly for yourself, I suspect. And if you're reading this last section, you're probably now exhausted, defeated from those earlier pages about my time in the camps, my witnessing of all those deaths. My life isn't easy to digest, but forgive me for being your mother because I am writing this section about you, my only son. Even if you already know the story, I want to explain one more thing properly, a memory that has gnawed at me for years. This you should also keep. Again, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm Devin Walker Figueroa. Hi. And this is my book, Philomen, named for, for Philomen. Gallowed Bee. The nearest land fills nowhere near, and no one is to blame. We burn the years, news in the meadow, in the mind, till the crosswords and the funnies wilt to winter kill. I trace the day an epitaph in ash. Hallowed be thy games. Every story is ashamed to be true. My father's now a widower and no one is to blame. My sister doesn't laugh, plots to live on land turned tame where the soils kissed with concrete yields no wine. It's all the same to me if we winnow if we win. I tell myself the story that I'll visit. Distant cisterns let their sallow walls win me over, lift my low life and lowly frame of mind. My father gets fined for burning out of season, says he doesn't get why. So the days go slow and I climb a pulsing fence that stops no bucks nor does observe the neighbor's piglets wallow in their loam. Still, the world is wide if the hymnals hold true. And every beast has a mind to get loose from a valley fallowing toward fowl. My sister braids my waist length mane says this place is lame. I try to tell her, no one is to blame, but the sky is so hollow, it swallows every name. Hi, my name is Joshua Prager, and my book is The Family Row, An American Story. Roe v. Wade was so named for its pseudonymous plaintiff, Jane Roe, and its defendant, Dallas District Attorney Henry Wade. But at its heart, the case did not pit Roe against Wade. It pitted her against the fetus she was carrying, and the court's ruling alluded, if only obliquely, 
to the existence of the child that fetus became, wrote Blackman. The normal 266 day human gestation period is so short that the pregnancy will come to term before the usual appellate process is complete. Blackman was making a simple legal point. It did not matter that the gestation of a lawsuit is longer than the gestation of a baby. The case had not been rendered moot because its plaintiff was no longer pregnant. But Blackman did not write that Jane Roe had given birth, and the public was left to assume that Jane Roe, whoever she was, had gotten the abortion made legally available to her. Normally, a plaintiff is required to use her real name. The federal rules of civil procedure demand it, but owing to the stigma of abortion, an exception was made in Roe, and Blackman addressed it. Despite the use of the pseudonym, he wrote, no suggestion is made that Roe is a fictitious person. Jane Roe was real. Her name was Norma McCorby. And when in 2010, I read an article that mentioned that Roe had been decided too late for Norma to have an abortion, I wondered about the baby she'd placed for adoption 40 years before. I decided to look for her. Months after Norma gave birth to that child in 1970, she met her lifelong partner, Connie Gonzalez. Norma had just left Gonzalez when, in June 2010, I visited Gonzalez at her Dallas home. She told me that the stories Norma had told about herself were not true. Gonzalez's home was due to be foreclosed on when I returned to see her the next year. She pointed me to a cache of papers that Norma had left behind in the garage and did not want. Looking through her speeches and letters, her holy cards and sheet music. I wondered not only about the Roe baby, but about the other two daughters Norma had let go. I wondered also about Norma. Lifting a picture of Norma as a toddler atop a pony, I looked at the little house behind her up on piers and wondered too about her family rooted there on the banks of a Louisiana river. <clears throat> uh, hi there, uh, my name is Sam Quinones. I'm the author of The Least of Us, True Tales of America and Hope in the Time of Fentanyl and Meth. I'm sorry for joining you late. I have a massively bad non-COVID flu. So um, I will try to make it through this. <laughs> so, uh, the addiction crisis has been telling us that to defend ourselves, we'd be wise to re-examine how we live, to rethink what we eat and drink, to limit or block social media and disconnect 24-hour cable news, reducing the fire hose of narcotic outrage. Cable news is no longer journalism. The job of a journalist is not to relentlessly tell us how right we are and thus how virtuous. The crisis is teaching us to be wise to get our news by reading it and demand more of ourselves as we develop opinions instead of swiping them from memes and ranters. That we'd be easily wise to shed inquisitorial political correctness, cancel culture and bizarre QAnon conspiracies and instead fight hard for what brings us together. It's telling us that, that we'd be wisest to get outside and be among other Americans. Then we can see we are every man who can't breathe. We are every masked nurse on a packed ward, every addict eating from the trash, every kid hoping for more, for more than his crack-ridden street. We are every cop carrying someone's child from a meth house. The pandemic is schooling us in our need for each other and how we need to be touched. In its aftermath, as workers commute less, we may see a renewal of life on the streets that, we ha we, that have been barren for years. That's my hope. Like the pandemic, fentanyl and methamphetamine present us with a huge opportunity for change. They're calling on us to embrace the ignored, the forgotten, and the despised around us, allow them space so that they might unlock their energies and abilities. When they do, like a natural resource, they will push us all forward. I'm not a Christian, but as I was writing this book, I read the Gospel of Matthew, the words of Matthew's Jesus to his disciples, encouraging them as they helped the poor, struck me. Inasmuch as you have done, as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it, ye have done it unto me, Jesus said. Matthew's Jesus urges us to attend to the unnoticed stuff, which will never appear on Instagram or the local news. That is our defense too, and the kind of story I was looking to tell in this book. 
It's raising an infant and caring for her bedridden mother. It's the joy that comes from removing a prostitute's pimp tattoo. It's running a community center in a crumbling neighborhood and saving a town's most reviled from lethal winter weather, adopting a pit bull and hiring an addict in recovery. After years of interviews, research, and writing, finally, that's what this national saga has left me with. That the lessons of neuroscience, the epidemic, and the pandemic are really the same. That we are strongest in community, as weak as our most vulnerable. And the least of us lie within us all. Hi, I'm Patrick Radden Keefe, and my book is Empire of Pain. David had talked about his desire to humanize his family. But one problem for the Sacklers was that, unlike a lot of human beings, they didn't seem to learn from what they saw transpiring in the world around them. They could produce a rehearsed simulacrum of human empathy, but they seemed incapable of comprehending their own role in the story and impervious to any genuine moral epiphany. They resented being cast as the villains in a drama, but it was their own stunted, stubborn blindness that made them so well suited to the role. They couldn't change. One member of the panel was Jim Cooper, a veteran congressman from Tennessee, a state that had been ravaged by OxyContin. He had a courtly demeanor and spoke slowly, selecting his words with a careful professorial cadence. On the subject of the family's implacable refusal to recognize what they had done, Cooper said, I think Upton Sinclair once wrote that a man has difficulty understanding something if his salary depends on him not understanding. He continued, his voice soft and deliberate. Watching you testify makes my blood boil. I'm not sure that I'm aware of any family in America that is more evil than yours. My name is Clint Smith and I am the author of How the Word is Passed, A Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America. And this is an excerpt from the end. The history of slavery is the history of the United States. It was not peripheral to our founding, it was central to it. It is not irrelevant to our contemporary society, it created it. This history is in our soil, it is in our policies, and it must too be in our memories. Across the United States and abroad, there are places whose history are inextricably tied to the story of human bondage. Many of these places directly confront and reflect on their relationship to that history, and many of these places do not. But in order for us to collectively move forward, it is not enough to have a patchwork of places that are honest about this history while being surrounded by other spaces that undermine it. There must be a collective endeavor to learn and confront the story of slavery and how it has shaped the world we live in today. We can learn this history from the scholars who have unearthed generations of evidence of all that slavery was, from the voices of the enslaved and the stories and narratives they have left behind, from the public historians who have committed themselves to giving society language to make sense of what's in front of them, from the descendants of those who were held in chains and the stories that have been passed down through their families across time, from the museums that reject the temptation of mythology and that prioritize telling an honest and holistic story of how this country came to be, from the teachers who have pushed back against centuries of lies who have created classrooms for their students where truth is centered, by standing on the land where it happened, by remembering that land, by marking that land, by not allowing what happened there to be forgotten by listening to our own families, by sitting down and having conversations with our elders and getting insight into all they've seen. At some point, it is no longer a question of whether we can learn this history, but whether we have the co collective will to reckon with it. I'm Rebecca Solnit. My book is Orwell's Roses, and it's as much about the roses as Orwell himself, a bit of it, in the year 1910, Helen Todd, a campaigner for women's voting rights, went on an automobile 
went on an automobile tour of Southern Illinois, trying to recruit rural people to the cause. On the last night of the tour, she stayed with a farm family. Her bedridden hostess, who was in her 90s, told her that her daughter Lucy had stayed home and let the hired girl, Maggie, go to the rally because someone needed to tend her and because Lucy already believed in women's suffrage, but Maggie needed to hear more. In the morning, Todd, Maggie, and Lucy had breakfast together in the farmhouse kitchen at a table with a bouquet of lady slippers and a back door opening onto a yard full of hollyhocks. Maggie said, if you want to know what I liked best about the whole meeting, it was that about women voting so that everyone would have bread and flowers too. Lucy was so taken with this idea, Todd reports, that she asked Todd to send her, send her mother a pillow stamped with the slogan. Bread for all and roses too, said the pillow Todd delivered. She reflected in her magazine report on the phrase that was to become a refrain, first for the suffrage movement, then the labor movement, and then for radicals of the 1970s and after, declaring that women's votes would go toward helping forward the time when life's bread, which is home, shelter, and security, and the roses of life, music, education, nature, and books, shall be the heritage of every child that is born in the country, in the government of which she has a voice. There will be no prisons, no scaffolds, no children in factories, no girls driven onto the streets to earn their bread, and the day when there shall be bread for all and roses too. The phrase that seems to have condensed out of the conversation between two farm women and a political organizer in response to a suffragist speech went on to have an extraordinary life as the still familiar phrase, bread and roses. Bread fed the body, roses fed something subtler, not just hearts, but imaginations, psyches, senses, identities. It was a pretty slogan, but a fierce argument that more than survival and bodily well-being were needed and were being demanded as a right. It was equally an argument against the idea that everything that human beings need can be reduced to quantifiable, tangible goods and conditions. Roses in these declarations stood for the way that human beings are complex, desires are irreducible, that what sustains us is often subtle and elusive. Thank you. Hi, my name is C.K. Fisher and I am the author of Seed. Perceive. Val, you are a fool. You hear a knock, a thud, and sit up. That's no neighbor. No one is here. No one is left. You are talking to yourself, talking to the inside of your skull, talking to your hands. Listen, drift back to sleep, back to the dream. There is a vent in your chest, six louvered blades across your sternum. A hand reaches in, but gets caught, cut as it tries to pull back. Latitude North 41, longitude West 73. Gather your wits, girly. You sit up on a pile of towels by the defunct sump pump, dead quiet, no hum. The basement is smeared with mud in one corner, feces and mud, and someone is up there in the kitchen. You hear a man's weight on the floorboards, Footsteps that fade toward the north corner, then stop. For the moment, there is no sound, and you watch the space inside the picture frame swell up to fill it. The frame leans against the foundation. That's the empty story. Gray stones wedged in prickly cement, wet with groundwater, and you have been watching it. Then you hear the high pitch of a hinge, and boots clomp down the stairs, and he is there, a man standing four feet away with his hands behind his back, unarmed or his weapon concealed. He pushes a piece of candy toward you, which you eat. Who he is takes a long time to rise to the top of your mind. Brown sleeves, canvas vest with pockets, shaking rain off his hat. Roy, the UPS man. Get up, he says, there's a ship that's getting out. Hi, uh, my name is Danika Kelly, and uh, my book is 
the renunciations. Portrait of my father as a winged boar. When his mother dies by metal turned slicing blade, from her blood springs my father, whose name I refuse to say as he refuses his father, the half known man who sired him. In the dry LA light, the boy, my father, turns so that he is caught. One way, a winged boar, another, a giant, a gold blade of a man, both high skulled, thick maned, a juvenile without a sounder, a boy without a mother. He recognizes himself only in the man, carves himself into golden armor, but the rutting fact of him, the curved tooth, the thick neck and beating wings trembles beneath his skin. Whatever sheen the California sun burnishes out of his body, whatever good work his thickening hand compels, whatever woman he touches in the afternoon on the roof, he cannot deny his firstborn, his red fledgling, her many heads and hands, what he makes for her, a junk bike she loves, cattle, red in the field, a mirror, a red wreckage of her body. Hi, I'm Rajiv Mahabir. And I'm the author of Cutlish. Kuli. Kuli nam dharaya, je humke tej pakaraye, Cutlish chai san kate humke gainavame aike. With his whip scar iron shackle name, aja contract bong whole day cut cane. Come night, he drink up rum fiso until he wind up and pitch in the trench black water and cry, O oh, manager, until sugar and pressure claim he to I. The Bakra manager laugh we. So come, so done. I was born a crab dog devotee of the silent God, the jungle God, the God crosser of seas. White tongues licked the sweet demerara of my sores. Now, stateside. Americans erase my surf story. Call me Indian. Can't they hear Kalapani in my voice? My breath's marine layer when I say, they made us hold the name Kuli, like a cutlass it bid us coming to Guyana. Folk song. Ego tikana ke koj me urali, jungle jungle gujar ke hamar muluk nahi. You drown in a flood of bird song. Don't trouble with lyrics. The body is disjoint. Warbler and robin, children of broken eggs. How long can the belly hold a flame, lighting perch to perch in sage migration? Take these petals of joy. Place them on your tongue. Something inside does not sit still. A cardinal flame lights into dicot fireworks. This is your chest. This is your garden. Searching for a single perch, I wing jungle to jungle. I have no country. Thank you. Hello, my name is Chiswayo Panza and my book is The Reinhardt Frames. Taste of Cherry, Abbas Kirstami, 1997. On a drive with Mr. Badi in his tan Land Rover, silence grazes our ears, leaving our mouths half open, our throats letting out small clearings. The roads ahead wind into Mobius strips, Mr. Badi's hands loosely grabbing the wheel. I look to the Rover's tinted windows, wondering if we appear like Schrodinger's cat to other drivers, but I know it is the ostrich syndrome holding my silence when he asked me to pour 20 spadefuls of earth on his body in a hole he dug. On the street, discreet as our intent, searching for Mr. Badi's perfect burial, the lake front scent curls around us, retreating me to sore summers. The tension I developed against water after a friend drowned, a pack of boys, tightly bound as a tin of sardines, 
the soda cans in brown paper bags we carried to give us the mysticism of winos, the weight of slaughter and sun funeral home sign tugging at our collars, a death has occurred or is near. The brown and orange liquid we poured on fish coned by waves to shorelines, their bodies brazed by seagull beaks, eyes sinking into their skulls. We stuffed half lit little cigarettes inside them so their musk would not offend our noses. I don't want to give you a gun to kill me, I'm giving you a spade, Mr. Badi says. Just pretend you're farming and I am a nord to spread at the foot of crops. We reach a stoplight. My eyes expand to the bus that ran over the neighbor's daughter. The mother run into scattered limbs, attempting to sew back the southern child. I stared in wonder, thinking it was possible. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Diane Seuss, and I'm the author of Frank Sonnets. I hope when it happens, I have time to say, oh, so this is how it's happening. Unlike Frank hit by a Jeep on Fire Island, but not like dad who knew too long, six goddamn years in a young man's life, so long it made a sweet guy sarcastic. I want enough time to say, oh, so this is how I'll go and smirk at that last rhyme. I rhymed at times because I wanted to make something pretty, especially for Mikkel, who liked pretty things, soft and small things, who cried into a towel when I hurt myself. When it happens, I don't want to be afraid. I want to be curious. Was Mikkel curious? I'm afraid by then he was only sad. He had no money left, was living on green oranges, had kissed all his friends goodbye. I kiss lips that kissed Frank's lips, though not for me a willing kiss. I willingly kiss lips that kissed Howard's deathbed lips. I happily kiss lips that kiss lips that kissed Basquiat's lips. I know a man who said he kissed lips that kissed lips that kissed lips that kissed lips that kissed Whitman's lips. Who will say of me, I kissed her? Who will say of me, I kissed someone who kissed her? Or I kissed someone who kissed someone who kissed someone who kissed her. Thank you. And I think we are back to me as we have heard from everyone. And I just wanted to say that was incredible. So great. Thank you so much to everyone for being here and for uh, enlightening us and entertaining us with these amazing readings. I feel so lucky. Good luck to you all. And again, I'd like to just point out that for the first time in history, every book uh, was represented here. So thank you so much. Thank you to the members and the supporters of the National Book Critics Circle. And we're going to take a quick break and be back with the awards at 7pm Eastern Time. It has been my honor. Thank you.